Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're gonna try to consolidate some water sources and get at some of these geysers. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First, this saltwater geyser comes out at 95C. So when our dupes come down, and start working on the desalinators, they're gonna get scalded. But if we can dump the contents of this cool salt slush geyser that erupts at minus 10 C, that might help offset some of the temperature. The other reason is if we add up all of our geysers and our current cool steam vents, we're given a total of about seven kilos per second. But granted, we haven't analyzed this cool steam vent or this cool salt slush geyser. So I'm guessing that's gonna bring us up to about 10 kilos per second. That's not enough. Now we still have a little bit more exploration to do. We have this entire area here, some gaps listed in here, and a little small section right here where I doubt there's any geysers or vents. All that means is I think we're finally gonna head over to the other planet and see if we can find any water. When we go over to the star map, we can see that it does list a cool slush geyser and a cool salt slush geyser, but it doesn't say how many of these it has. I'm keeping my fingers crossed though. You may also remember from the last episode that we actually had to leave some dupes without names. Well, I did a call in the comments and said, hey, if you want a dupe name, you need to let me know. And the results were incredible. But now I have to go back and rename some of these unnamed dupes, which can be a pain in the butt. It's like a giant game of Where's Waldo, which gets me to thinking, does everybody around the world know what Where's Waldo is? Well, without further ado, let's introduce dupe 83, Cameron Christensen, dupe 84, Peyton A. Smith, Dupe 86, Ray the Great 19. Dupe 87, Light Phoenix 7000. Dupe 88, Jack Frost, who happened to have been standing right next to Dupe 89, Coda. And finally comes down to the last dupe that was unnamed. I wanted to show you actually how we're playing our Where is Waldo game. Going down into priorities, you can select the individual dupe and then just hit follow cam. We close out the window and there's duplicate number 90. It's actually been kind of fun finding all the dupes and seeing what they've been up to. And then we just click inside this box and change the dupe's name. And there's dupe 90, there. Now, before we play our giant game of let's go find the water, we need to put in giant silos to be able to store the water for each mega spawn. And it just so happens that this top mega spawn is getting all the regular clean water and the polluted water. And this bottom mega spawn is actually been getting all the salt and brine water. Here's a saltwater geyser here, and then the cool salt slush geyser is down here, which emits brine. Unfortunately, it's gonna be a long pipe run all the way up, but at least it's the same type of liquid that both of our desalinators can handle. And unfortunately, this saltwater geyser doesn't go dormant for another 73 cycles, and it's emitting water at 95C. And so while I'd like to get the cool salt slush geyser in here as quick as possible to chill out the water, I also wanted to open this up a little bit. The problem is our dupes would get horribly scalded. So you now know that it's time for more Atmo suits. Lucky for us, we already have power here and plenty of oxygen. While the dupes are getting to work on that, I figure it's time to start cracking open this. Now, I don't think there's going to be a way for us to do this without just getting absolutely messy down here. There's a ton of crude oil backlogged. Of course, I suppose we could go grab this diamond, allow all this crude oil to sink and then be able to frame this in. Let's see what I can come up with here. And let's go ahead and double check the abyssalite before we start digging that close to the crust. That could be a very bad day for most of this colony. All in all though, the crust looks pretty intact. Not a single break along the entire thing. I keep forgetting about this big steam vent too. We need to tap it as well, but 500C? That one's tough because even a regular steel liquid pump can only go up to 275C. You don't actually have to use a liquid pump though when taming these big giant steam vents. We can strap a couple of steam turbines on it. Granted, it'll come out around 95C, but that's a whole lot better than dealing with 500C steam. Right now though, this is definitely not something we want to get into for the main reason it's not dormant. Now we have some Atmos suits here, which is going to make it a lot safer for our next task, which is to core all of this out. This is going to be sort of a staging area for all of our salt and brine water. Well, this kind of worked. We have a lot of diamond down here, which we're gonna go ahead and scoop all up. We're gonna continue digging down through here just to grab up all the nice, beautiful lead. But the important part is that we can now get to this geyser sort of unimpeded by all the oil. Ooh, let's mop all that oil up too. Our next dupe has suit wearing with a plus eight athletics, which I absolutely love. They also have early bird, noodle arms, and they are undigging. 
don't worry about the noodle arms, because as you can see, it's offset by the supplying. Welcome to dupe number 91, Dragon. Our next dupe enjoys the simple things in life, like digging and creativity. Unfortunately, they have noodle arms, but once again, we'll put them into some improved carry, so it's not a big deal. Welcome to dupe number 92, Dr. Anders. The next dupe's a builder with an iron gut who's squeamish and a small bladder. Welcome to dupe number 93, Thorsten Zegren. So I'm actually a little worried sending somebody through this teleporter for a couple of reasons. One, who do we send? Two, what's waiting for us on the other side? Because if I kill one dupe after keeping 92 dupes alive, it's going to send me into quite a little tizzy. But most of all, because as soon as we go to this planetoid and the dupe appears here and it lights up this entire area, that's going to be another 5-10% lag on the simulation. Granted, those are just guesses, but we're basically introducing a whole other part of the map. In order to make sure that whoever we send can do just about anything over there, we're going to send one of our most experienced dupes. Duplicate number one, Miko Nala, enjoys doing digging, but since they've been here for so long, they're decent at other things too. For instance, they have a 17 strength, an 8 construction, although they only have a 6 athletics. That's a little odd. John Mann here, though, has a 9 in construction, a 15 in excavation, and a 15 in athletics. So why don't we go ahead and skill scrub John Mann and send him over? And the reason why we're going to go ahead and skill scrub him first is because if we get over there and they need field research, we'll have the points to be able to put in without taking a huge morale penalty. I just noticed that there's nine tons of polluted dirt sitting here. All right, John Mann is out of the skill scrubber, but I want to give him some sort of basic capabilities. For instance, hard digging is probably a must, and then one point into improved carry. So on this colony, they have 19 morale. We'll see what it drops to once they're at a new colony, but right now their skill requirement is only two, so we don't have to be worried about it. All right, John Mann has just woken up for the day. Unfortunately, they have a small case of slime lung, but hey, nothing a new planet won't take care of. Good luck, John. You're taking all my frames with you. Step one for John is going to be able to get a bathroom up. Ooh, we have another dupe here. They've supposedly made the cryo tank hold a much better dupe. And they even start with some extra points. Once we get things set up, I think we're going to go ahead and defrost John a friend. We do have a little bit of water here for some starter bathrooms. So sending John over with a touch of slime lung was probably a mistake. In my defense, I didn't know they had slime lung until they were already in the teleporter. And by then, it's already too late, right? So we're in the middle of trying to set up John Man a little home here. It's not going great, but hey, John's still alive, so that's a good thing. The big problem is there's mud everywhere, so as soon as you dig one out, the rest just falls. I'm starting to think I should have built up and then over instead of down here, but eh, it's too late now. I'm hoping to fend off the avalanche of mud by putting in a few well-placed tiles, and it so far is working decent, thanks to John Man's corner building skills, and then we can finally put in the toilet. I dare say this is starting to look like a home. Granted, it's not a great home, but here's the general plan. We're gonna build a wall right here to be able to collect all this polluted water, and that way when we dig through here, all this mud will drop, but the water will stay there. Now, I found the supply teleporter output, but we haven't found the input yet. But it'd be great to be able to send all those goodies back home. Our next dupe's an operator decorator who doesn't like to do digging, but does a little bit of plumbing on the side. Welcome to dupe number 94, Carol. The next dupe has all sorts of things going on. They like building, farming, decorating. They also love animals. They have an iron gut and they're a kitchen menace. Welcome to dupe number 95. Super awesome Goku. Our next dupe is really good at farming and rocketry. They have Diver's Lung, which is a huge win. They're a caregiver. Unfortunately, they're a slow learner, which means it's going to take them a long time to gain skill points. Welcome to the colony, dupe 97, French Stud. John's world is looking up. We're about to put down the second wash basin and outhouse. We're going to be able to defrost the friends soon. We got this pool here, which the best part about it is it's just off-gassing polluted oxygen. And there's so many little pockets and pools of polluted water everywhere. I don't even know how long it's going to be until we have to put down some sort of oxygen supply. One of the great things about working over here on this second colony is the fact that it actually has some dirt. In addition to the loads of dirt just built into the environment, we're also going to be able to use a sludge press and get as much dirt as we can out of all of this mud. And this is a good thing, too. 
because over on our home planetoid, we've been going around picking up every little bit that we can find in the space biome just so we can continue our millwood production until our other food sources sort of kick in. And the great thing about dirt is the tiles themselves are thick. You figure this tile here is 1,788 kilos. Yeah, you lose 50% for digging it out, but that's still almost a ton of dirt in every single tile. We've got a couple of bathrooms set up now, and I think we're almost ready to thaw out whoever's in the cryotank 3000. But we need to get a food source going, and I think for this colony, we're going to be going with the almighty bog bucket. Yeah, it's going to take some polluted water that we have, but it's a good enough staple crop to start with before we get stabilized here. We may even be able to grow some and send it back to the other colony. Speaking of which, I still gotta go find that other teleporter. Now granted, it does take 40 kilos of polluted water, so again, it'll just be temporary until we get another stable crop going. Another great thing about this planetoid is it's full of cobalt ore. Ooh, it also has some uranium and some bees. I feel like nuclear is going to be an option here soon. And the reason why that is clutched and just in time is we're down to just a little bit over a ton of copper and a half a ton of copper ore. And most of the deposits remaining on this planetoid are iron ore and lead. Now I fully plan on replacing as much of the wiring as we can with lead to recover some of that copper because in the process of building our giant water tower, we're running out of metal ores to be able to do it with. And we're definitely not touching our iron ore for anything other than steel. And for those curious, yes, you can use minus 60 dirt to fertilize your plant. You can see this planter box is losing heat, but it's much slower than this dirt is gaining it. Not to mention all the mass that is around this point, and it's only 30 kilos of cold dirt compared to the temperature of the planter boxes and everything else, it can work. Now, I wouldn't recommend continuously doing it, but for temporary purposes or when you're just trying to survive, it'll work out in a pinch. With the second cot in, I think it's time to defrost our friend. We have a lot of things to do around here. First of all, we need to clean up all this polluted oxygen. Don't know how we're gonna do that yet, but overall just make this a sort of midterm colony. That's whole purpose in life is sending stuff back to the main colony. And here comes a fresh Gossman. This Gossman is good at supplying, cooking, and ranching. This is actually going to come in pretty handy here. They have the ancient knowledge, which gives them three skill points. They're biohazardous, and they're a vomitor sparkle streaker. Now to give this Gossman a name, shall we? Welcome to dupe number 96, Alex So. Now, Alec specifically mentioned that they wanted to be dupe number 96. Like a lot of folks, they requested a specific number. Unfortunately, I can't give everyone the same number, which has happened a couple of times. So basically, first come, first serve sort of situation. But most people are just requesting to be in the colony anyways. And that makes it easy because, well, we have plenty of dupes to name. I think we're going to start Alec with their three skill points. One into carrying, one into cooking, and one into farming. They're all tier one skills, and two of them they actually enjoy doing, so it's not too bad of a morale hit. Now I'm going to highlight the priorities on this new colony because it's important. When you start a fresh colony like this, it's important to make sure that your priorities are very tight. Namely, because if you just bring a digger builder around, they're never going to get around to filling the wash basins and doing the toilets. It's for this reason that I blanked John Mann out. They have no priority. It just works from left to right. But for Alec, we're going to make sure they do all the cooking and all the farming. Now, we don't have a grill yet, but we're getting ready to put down all those bog buckets. I wanted to highlight an earlier example. Notice here the dirt is climbing up over zero degrees and the planter box is still at 15.3. All right, so here's the basic bog bucket plan. Now we're gonna go from pond to pond to pond, collecting all the polluted water we can as we explore out looking for that teleporter. And as we do, we're gonna continuously fill all these liquid reservoirs who are also gonna be used as a buffer to feed all of these bog buckets. Now bog buckets are pretty simple. You give them 40 kilos of water over six and a half cycles and you get 1,840 calories worth of bog jellies. If you do the math, 1,840 divided by 6.6, .6, you're given just a little bit above 278 calories per cycle. So then we know it takes four bog buckets to support one dupe. Given that we have 27 hydroponic tiles, we're gonna be able to support six or seven dupes with this many bog buckets. And that's not even counting the fact that once we get the electric grill going, we're going to be able to turn those bog jellies into Swampy Delights. So when you take the Swampy Delights 
2,240 calories and divide that by 6.6 cycles, then you're given over 339 calories, which means you'll be able to support a dupe on just three bug buckets, which means the same amount of hydroponic farms can support nine dupes. Now our two dupes here are gonna have plenty to do. I'm not sure if we're gonna cook them here or wait until we get over to our primary colony to cook them. As long as John and Alec get to eat a little bit of them, we'll be fine whether or not they're Swampy Delights or Bog Buckets. Back over on our main planetoid, it's time to crack this cool salt slush geyser open. And I just realized we still need power down here. That is a forever run, isn't it? I suppose we have this one here. Looks like it's time to blow some more lead. Look what we've stumbled on in our second colony. An infinite source of dirt. So if we use this beautiful pip to pip plant a bunch of arbor trees, not only will the pips eat the lumber and then excrete dirt, but then we can also take the excess lumber and turn it into power or ethanol. We're going to have to think about this a little bit. After last video, there was a couple of comments about why I didn't place these natural gas generators inside the steam room. And I admit it was a great idea. While I didn't necessarily want to vent the carbon dioxide all over the place, as far as putting it down here, maybe feeding it to slicksters or something like that, I also just didn't want longer gas pipe runs. But the great thing is all the polluted water that it would have came out of it would have instantly flashed the steam and then given us dirt. But there was a couple of reasons why I didn't. Yes, the natural gas generator generates heat, but the polluted water that it spits out would cause there to be an increased requirement of heat inside this chamber, which would have required us using even more magma. And I'm not sure in the long run whether or not the volcano could keep up. Not only that, the polluted water would instantly flash the steam, but then we'd have to take the steam, output it from the steam turbine, and put it back in with the rest of our water supplies for use. And once again, that would have been more plumbing pipes spread throughout our base. I mean, as it is, this is a relatively low amount of plumbing pipes considering where we are in the colony. So in the end, all of this system is pretty self-contained. Yeah, we're sending the polluted water back just a little bit, but all the power is being directly injected here. The natural gas only has to travel this far, so in the end, I thought the little substation system worked pretty well. And yes, I did see this. I have no idea why those are still there. Our next dupe is one of the better ones we've received in probably five or six printing pod runs. They're an operating cooking and researcher with green thumb and germ resistant. Their only negative is that they have an irritable bowel. Welcome to the colony, dupe 98. Adam G. The next dupe, a tidying expert with a plus eight strength. They're also uncultured and they're a shabby dresser. Welcome to dupe 99, Mernie. Our next dupe's an operating night owl who's uncultured with a small bladder, but they're also special for the fact this is duplicate number 100. Welcome to the colony, Mice Man 391. While we're down here getting that geyser going, I remembered that we have a cobalt volcano down here. I'd really like to tame this sooner rather than later because, well, I'd love the free cobalt. But it's not going to be as much of a priority because the limitation is not in our refined metals, but rather in our unrefined metals, the ores themselves. We're making decent progress. There's only two dupes, so there's only really so much they can do in a day. We've managed to get three of these liquid reservoirs complete, and we're about to dump all of this polluted water into this one tank which will allow this pump to fill up all these reservoirs. And that's not even counting all these other polluted water pools as well. Now I know what you're thinking. Echo, you need water. Why are you spending it on bog buckets? We don't need water per se. I mean, we have a little bit in back stock, right? What we need is sustainable water, i.e. vents and geysers. That's where we need the water. Based on my estimates, we're gonna hit 150 dupes before we even run out of the water that's available on the map. Well, I just realized one awesome source of copper ore, replacing all these heavy watt wires. It's probably a little bit of overkill, but we're just gonna replace a bunch of it with heavy watt conductive wire. Well, we finished analyzing this cool salt slush geyser and the news is not great. It's only 1.32 kilos, which brings our known calculated average output of water to about 8.3 kilos. We're gonna get this thing all cleaned out sealed in, built some ladders around it so we can still go over to the other side, and that'll be that for that geyser. Not that we're going to realize its output for another 
34 cycles. Since we're nearing the end of an episode, I figured to give you an update on the planter box with the minus 60 degree dirt. Well, the dirt's up to 11 degrees and the planter box is down to 12. Worked out pretty well. Now we're only sitting at 250,000 calories, which is only enough food for about two and a half cycles. The key is that we're bringing in so much food from other sources, you'll see that our pickled meal is still sitting at almost 175,000 because it's the last food to be eaten. One question remains is, would I be willing to spend 45 tons in gold amalgam and about 150 reed fiber to fully decor out all the necessary barracks that we need for this colony? <laughs> yes, I would. You were looking at 152 cots. I would have liked to make it a little bit more symmetrical, but this kitchen's in the way. Eventually, this kitchen's gonna need to go away anyways, but for now, we just built around it. Have you ever seen a mass art project like this before? I mean, this should be some sort of exhibit, right? So I suppose it's time to reveal the beautiful water tower. Now, there's nothing very complicated about this process. We're gonna be bringing all of our fresh water in through here, so it comes all the way to the top of the water tower and then siphons all the way down and then into the mega spawn setup. Now, why are we doing this? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, because when we're at max, we're gonna be using 12 tons of water every single day. If you split it between the mega spawns, that accounts for about a little bit more than one liquid reservoir. So you have a definable amount that you can watch and make sure that you have as much water that you need. You know if you see only five reservoirs full, you only have about five cycles of water remaining. Now eventually we're gonna put some nice automation on this with some pixel packs and be able to light it up and it's gonna show exactly how full our water reservoirs are. Now at 400 kilos per liquid reservoir, we haven't even started the water tower on this bomb yet. By the way, we're gonna play a little bit of trivia. You'll notice this battery is not charging. I sat here and looked at the automation, making sure the automation was all right. And then I looked at the power. Yup, it looks good and couldn't figure it out. So I'll give you a second to see if you caught it. Yep, the battery was never actually hooked up. That stinks a lot. All the hydrogen's being burned off immediately because the generators aren't actually charging the battery. They're just keeping the power transformers going. So we're going to break in there real quick and fix this. Our last dupe of the episode is a researching and farming specialist. They are an early bird with a small bladder. Welcome to the colony dupe 101, Brad Rogowski. We should be really proud of Alec and John's progress. They've managed to get this colony operational and set up somewhat for the future. We have eight bog buckets here being supplied by all this polluted water. We have all these liquid reservoirs and that way we can continue pumping all of the polluted water into the reservoirs, setting ourselves up for the future. Eventually we're gonna grow more bog buckets and send them back to the primary colony just as soon as we find the teleporter. Next up for this colony is gonna be installing one of these sublimation stations and that way we can continue to breathe. As it stands, there's plenty of polluted oxygen thanks to it off-gassing from the polluted water, but eventually we'll need something a little bit more stable. Over on the main colony, our water tower system is working wonderfully. All the water is coming into the very, very top and then siphoning all the way down at the bottom. Now, since this thing just started, you can see we only have about a reservoir and a half full, but eventually this whole thing will fill up. And when it does, we will know that we have a good 20 to 25 cycle cushion. And then finally, our art collection is complete. I think we have used every single piece of art available to the dupes. Part of the reason why is because we have all sorts of decorator dupes that can do artwork from the crude all the way to the masterwork. And the result is just an amazing art show. Oh yeah, and the decor is not too bad either. That's really gonna help out with dupe morale. The other mega spawn almost has its water tower complete. We're well, sitting at 17 tons of dirt, 1,000 tons of sand, 12 tons of slime, and plenty more where that came from. So once again, things are somewhat stable. Would love to hear your ideas of what we should do next in this colony, other than the fact that we need to keep growing more food to keep surviving. So let me know in the comments below. I hope you had a great time watching this episode. I know I did. And I'll talk to you soon.